Okay, so all right. There's that. So here's what we're gonna do. I was going to put for your group projects. Um, I allow you to vote, and so in order to calculate the final grade, what I do is I have to have those votes back. I had posted those on D2L in the past and had students submit them into a Dropbox, and that way it aggregates them into each group's sort of file. So I put together a group, I set it up in D2L, and then it aggregates. And there is a way that you used to be able to do it that would allow you to submit those into a Dropbox without everybody else in the group showing it. It basically is called an anonymous submission. It, it's a box that you check on DQL. And for some reason, it's not working. I don't know why. I have called the DQL tech people, and it's just a mystery as to how that works. And so there was, well, you, there are other ways you could do it. You can set it up as a survey on DQL. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to post on D2L a ballot for you that you will fill out and then just bring back next Tuesday to class. And just, so you'll fill it out, type it in, fill it out, and bring it back and fold it over in half. Uh, this way, I want it folded. So when you bring it in, fold it like this so that nobody will see it. Don't fold it like this because it just makes it difficult if everybody folds it all kinds of different ways. So fold it in half, you know, from the top to the bottom, not from side to side. And that would be much appreciated. So that's where we are on getting your uh, grades. That's why I haven't posted those grades to D2L yet, because I had to get that ballot. Like I said in the past, what I've done is I released the ballot in D2L, and then it's worked well. But because it's not allowing for anonymous submissions, basically that would totally eliminate the purpose of voting because you would be able to see how not only you voted, but everybody else voted in your group for you by name because it shows who posted into the Dropbox, which would, I guess, not be good in terms of a sort of a confidentiality perspective. So today, we need to talk about, we talked about employee rights last time, the meaning and value work and then before the the presentations, we talked about the meaning of value work and then employee rights. And today we need to talk about employee responsibilities. And then we will move into products on Tuesday. So we'll talk about products and pricing on Tuesday. And then we'll move into promotion and place. And that will sort of bring us to the end of the semester. And what I'll do is then the last day of class, I will give you the third or the second exam and then the final at the final exam time you'll bring that back and we'll take the final so for every right that you have we probably have or we may have corresponding responsibilities and I'll use this as my opportunity to get on my soapbox and tell you that for example under our constitutional form of government since I teach political marketing, I'm going to use this as my, my opportunity to make my shameless plug for, uh, you know, you have a right to vote under our Constitution, and that also entails a corresponding responsibility, which is, you should do what? You should vote. If you have a right to vote, you also have a responsibility to exercise that vote, because if you don't, the democracy itself may fail. And I teach political marketing, and that's something that we need to worry about, is whether or not the democracy will fail if not enough people participate. And we don't participate in large enough numbers. So taking that analogy and applying it to employee responsibilities in the workplace, we talked about a lot about rights. What are some of the corresponding responsibilities? If the employer owes you rights, what are your responsibilities then to that employer? Well, we can start, your text starts on page 155 with what we might call the narrow view of employee responsibilities. And they say this is the narrow view, but I'm not sure that it is. And there is one part of this narrow view that is controversial. And the narrow view, 
And the reason it's not universal is because I'm not so really sure that it's all that narrow. This narrow view, as they take it, is employees as agents. Now, this is derived from the law of agency. And I guess that's why they say this is the narrow view, because it's derived from absolute, just, legal, contractual principles. And what are the laws of agency? So why is the law of agency in business important? Particularly, let's think about this from the perspective of a corporation. Why is the law of agency important with this idea of a corporation? Maybe the law of agency is less important when you're dealing with other types of business formation. So let's take a step back and think about this. What are the types of business organizations that we can have in the United States? There's what? Okay, the simplest form of business is what we might call the DBA, which is also called a what? Sole proprietorship. What's a DBA? Doing business as. What's a DBA? Or a sole proprietorship? You what? You're it. You are the company and the company is you, probably, in a sole proprietorship. How many of you grew up in families where you had an entrepreneur and you had a sole proprietorship. Mine has changed, it's now a, a partnership. But growing up, I had two models. One of the reasons that I became a college professor was I had two models to follow. I had my mother who was an entrepreneur in a sole proprietorship. She owned real estate companies and an art gallery and a contracting company. And then she's gone on and owned other businesses. And I had my father who was an FBI agent. My father retired at 55 years of age. That's when the FBM mandates that she retires at 55. Yeah, he retired at 55. He's now 80 and he's drawn 80% of his high salary plus cost of living adjustments since 55. That's a pretty good deal. And as a professor here at UCO, I can retire at 55 with 60% of my high three, an average of my high three salary. So, uh, and then there's my mother who's still working at 66 years of age because she's been a sole proprietor and you know you're a sole proprietor your retirement is basically depending on how much you can save and the business is in many respects very consuming and so you have the sole proprietorship DBA and you are the business and the law of agency probably applies less to these types of, of businesses because who's going to make their decisions for the business and who's going to act on behalf of the business well, it's going to be the, the, the proprietor, although it may play a role in that sometimes sole proprietors do engage the use of agents. You hire attorneys, and your attorney acts as your agent in certain things. They basically are your mouthpiece in court. You hire agents to negotiate deals for you uh, in terms of real estate contracts, real estate agents. That's you know, what they're called, and they, um, they represent you as either a buyer or seller. They've now gotten away from that in Oklahoma, and almost all real estate agents are now what they call transactional agents, which means that they don't represent either the buyer or the seller, they represent the what? They represent the transaction, the facilitation of the sale of the piece of property. So DBA, what's another form of business that we can have in the United States? The nice thing about the DBA or the sole proprietorship is it's what? What can I do to establish a business in Oklahoma? And I don't have to let anybody know. I can just, I, you know, it doesn't require. One of the things that I say, this is an example of how marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm. I don't have to know anything about finances. I really don't have to know anything about accounting. Those might be good, but what kind of business could I start in Oklahoma that would require, you know, I don't have to go out and finance it at all. I could just do it, and I don't have to let anybody know. Don't have to know anything about finance, accounting. Don't have to file any forms down at the state <coughs> to do it. What could I do? Well, there are lots of things I could do. I could start. You have to, 
to mow yards or do you have to let anybody know you're going to mow yards or can you just ride around in your pickup truck with a lawnmower in the back and say, Grant's really good yard care. You can do that. I could be a, a lawyer. There was a guy when I first started practicing law who he didn't have a phone. His phone number on his business cards was the pay phone next to the shoe shine stand down at the Oklahoma County Courthouse. He'd sit there every morning and answer calls as he was getting his shoe shined, and he'd go get you know clients by showing up at misdemeanor and criminal felony dockets. There's always somebody that's looking for an attorney, and so he didn't have to, you know. I mean, I don't have to know anything about finance to do that. I'm a licensed practicing attorney, and I can hang out the shingle uh, on my door, tape something up. I can stand on the side of the road with a sign that says, I are a lawyer, hire me, and away we go. Can you do that? So this is an interesting example of how you cannot confuse substantive types of law with the ease in which you can engage in the business formation. Could you do that? Could you stand out on the side of the road saying, I are a lawyer, hire me? No, you can't. Why? Because that deals with not business formation, but the substantive area of the law called the regulation of the practice of law. And in order to be a licensed practicing attorney and say, I am a lawyer and uh, solicit uh, services, you know, hang out your shingle, you have to be a member of the Oklahoma Bar Association. If you aren't, that's called what? The unauthorized practice of law and it's a crime. No, you don't want to do that. The Bar Association will come after you. But there are lots of things you can do. You can start a lawn mowing company, what else? You can sell your Cupid dolls by the side of the road and a stand or your lemonade stand. How many of you had lemonade stands as a kid? A couple of you, how many of you had some other kind of stand? Sole proprietorship. What's the other, the next type of business? Partnership. Partnership. Now, agency may come more into play in partnership because now you've increased the complexity of the relationship. Now you have more than one person in a partnership. And you get lots. What's the advantage of a sole proprietorship? Easy to form. You don't have to go down to the state of Oklahoma and say, I'm in business to be a sole. I don't have to tell the state, um, since I am a licensed practicing attorney, I don't have to say, hey, I'm now going into business for myself. I don't have to file for an Oklahoma tax permit because attorneys don't charge taxes in this state. So it's very easy. A partnership, same thing. You complicate it a little bit because now you've got not one person, but two. And that can lead to problems in terms of the arrangements of how you're going to organize yourself and partnerships can be problematic for a lot of but it, it's not problematic from the standpoint of having to tell the state that you formed one. Then you get various forms of limited liability, right? Popular now, traditionally limited liability, there was one form. The old traditional form of limited liability was called the corporate form. Corporations are creatures of the state. So the oldest form and the traditional is the corporation. Now, the corporation requires that you tell the state that you're incorporating. Because what you get with the corporate form is what? Limited liability. So it's more complicated. To start one of these, you have to go down to the Secretary of State's office. There's a form. You can get it online. You fill it out. You have to have minutes. You have to have officers. You have to have all of this stuff. In the olden days, you had to have at least some stock. You used to have to have shareholders meetings and things like that. You had to have a corporate seal. That was required. It was a, a racket for the seal companies like Walker Seal, Stamp and Seal. You'd have to go down to Walker Stamp and Seal, which is located not very far from the Capitol. And you'd have to get this corporate seal that you'd put on all of your documents, like your stock documents and things like that. The advantage of this, now the advantage of this type is you can start it. I don't have to let anybody know. The disadvantage of this type and this type is that you have what? Unlimited liability for your entity. So if I really mess something up, somebody can sue me and I'm personally liable. So if I start this lawn mowing business and lawn mowings, 
can be dangerous. What kinds of things can happen with a lawnmower? Well, you can have a lawnmower that you know hits a rock and shoots the rock out and hits some kid in the head, and all of a sudden they're suing you. And what are they going to take? Well, if you don't have limited liability, they're going to take a lot of stuff. In Oklahoma, they're going to take less stuff than they would take in some place that doesn't have as good of protection for owners of property as Oklahoma. But they're going to take your stuff. If you have bank accounts and you, you hit the kid in the eye and he's blinded, they're going to take your bank accounts. They're going to take your uh, property that they can get for the business, your lawn or your truck and things like that. What are they not going to take in Oklahoma? They're not going to take your house because we have an unlimited homestead exemption from the attachment of creditors uh, for things like that in Oklahoma. So we can't uh, take that. They can't take your house. That's a good thing. So if you file bankruptcy in Oklahoma and your house is paid for, guess what? You get to keep your house. Why do you think O.J. Simpson left California and moved to Florida? California didn't have a limited <coughs> homestead. And when he got sued by the Goldman family, he decided to look for a state that he could put all of his money basically into a big mansion in Florida. Florida has unlimited homestead exemptions. So he had this house, this estate that was worth millions and millions of dollars. And when the Goldman and uh, Brown family sued him and got a huge judgment against him, guess what they couldn't get in Florida that they could have gotten in California? Well, they couldn't get his house. So he put most of his assets in his house and that was uh, free from attachment. So they're not going to get your house in Oklahoma because we have unlimited homestead, but everything else they're going to get. What's the advantage of this type of, of formation? Well, it limits the liability. You put people on notice that no longer are you personally liable for these kinds of things. And if your business does something, they can't sue you personally for it. They, they can't take away all of your assets. So you go down to the, the state and you form a corporation. There are now new reforms. The disadvantage of the corporate form historically has been a tax disadvantage, which was because corporations, and Mitt Romney was accused of saying something that was stupid on the campaign trail when he ran four years ago for president. Somebody said, you know, corporations are evil and da 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 da. And Mitt Romney said, corporations are people, my friends. And they are. Corporations are legal people. What does that mean? Well, it means they can sue and be sued in their own name. They can own property in their own name. They are legal entities. So corporations are people, and you have to sue the corporation rather than the individual in order to recover. It limits the liability, and why do we do this? Well, it allows for the pooling of capital in our financial system. No one's going to invest in Grant Geary lawn mowing company if they know that every time I hit a rock and blind some kid in the street, they could be liable for the entire amount. That will happen in a sole proprietorship or partnership. Your partners are equally and severally liable for all torts and things like that that might occur. So we allow for the pooling of capital and the formation of corporations. The disadvantage of this form was because corporations are legal people, you were taxed, in essence, twice. People who own the corporation are taxed on their personal income. They have to file a personal income tax, and corporations are taxed on their corporate income as people, yeah. So if you give like, your partnership personal like, public, does that make it like, a Okay, if you do that, that does not necessarily, you're going to have to form in order to do that, you are going to have to form a limited liability sort of company. And that's, we get away from the corporate form now. We now have other forms like the limited liability company, which function more like a partnership, but allow you to have unlimited liability. And they don't have all of the formalities and the tax consequences that the corporate form does. So what limited liability companies do, and sub S corporations under the tax code, is they allow for you to say, well, I made this money as my partnership, I'm escaping liability, but I'm not going to be taxed on it twice. I'm not going to be taxed on it as a corporation and then myself, it treats it as a partnership for tax income tax purposes. But that's then that involves the intersection of two things. So you have to go down, you have to form a corporation, that's state law, taxation is both state and federal law. And so you have to then tell the IRS that this is a recognized entity, but you want it to be taxed as though it's an individual or a partnership. Does that make sense? So you get this advantage of this. So we get other forms of the corporate form now that are more 
unique, the LLC, the limited liability company, the limited partnership, the limited liability partnership, LPs, um, the professional corporation for things like law firms, and those allow for taxation to be treated like individuals but have the unlimited or have the limited liability of the corporate form. Now, in the corporate form, what happens is because the organization becomes more complex, you have to start acting. Since a corporation is a legal person, and this was my point, since the corporation is a legal person, just like Mitt Romney said they were, what does that mean? Well, corporations can't actually act. They don't get up and walk around. So how do they act? Well, they act through their agents. So the law of agency becomes important. Corporations act through their officers and directors and employees. These people function as agents. So when I own a corporation, when Ches Chesapeake or Devon want to buy stuff and contract for stuff, the company itself can't sign the contract. A corporate officer has to sign for it. And they are acting in an agency capacity on the part of the corporation. What does the agency capacity deal with? Well, you have two things. You have a principal, which is the corporation or the individual. And then you have the agent. And there are rights and duties of both. The principal has the responsibility to fulfill the obligations that the agent binds them to, for which they are authorized. The principal has the duty to pay the agent who's acting on their behalf. And the agent then has duties. The agents, so this is in the law of agency, the agent has two basic responsibilities. One is the duty of obedience. So the principal is liable for the actions of the agent that the agent takes on behalf of the principal that <clears throat> they are engaging in in the scope of their employment or the scope of their agency. <clears throat> so if I hire an agent to go out and negotiate, for example, on my behalf for land purchases, that agent can bind me legally to contracts that they sign on my behalf. Now they have to obey what I say. So if I say, I'm giving you my power of attorney to go out and negotiate land deals on my behalf because I have, let's say, a oil company. Let's say I'm a wildcatter out there in the oil business. And I want somebody to go out and purchase up leaseholds. That's a real property interest. I'm bound by what they do. If they go out and buy, I can't say, well, you acted you know, poorly. I didn't expect you to buy that leasehold. They have the ability to, to buy leaseholds. I'm bound by that. And the agent has a duty of obedience. I give you an agency. I give you the right, my power of attorney, to go out and buy leaseholds. Does that mean that you can go out and buy gold. No. I told you that you're supposed to do what? You're acting in my agent, you have my power of attorney to go out and buy what? Leaseholds. So you have this duty of obedience. The second duty that you have is the duty of loyalty. This comprises what we call these two, the fiduciary duty of the agent. What is the agent going to do? They have a duty to do and act as you direct them to act. And within that, this fiduciary duty means that they should not create waste. So I shouldn't go out and willy-nilly, carelessly uh, treat your money as though it were my own and go to the casino and gamble with it instead of going out and buying leaseholds. And I have a duty of loyalty. What does that mean? Well, if I'm acting as your agent to go out and buy leaseholds and I decide all of a sudden, well, hey, this looks like a pretty good business, by the way. I would not recommend going out and being a wildcatter in Oklahoma right now. Because the oil business is a history of boom and bust. 
But let's suppose that I'm out there and I'm working for somebody as their agent to, to buy lease holds for them. And I decide, well, this is, I, I think this is a really good lease. And I decide, well, I'll buy this lease hold over there for them, but I'm going to keep this one for myself. I've now violated the duty of loyalty. I shouldn't engage in self-dealing for myself to the disadvantage of my principal. I violated this duty of loyalty, this fiduciary duty that I have. Now, why can this be problematic in the modern world? Well, let's look at trust and loyalty in the workplace. A lot of philosophers now say that this idea of imposing this duty of loyalty on an employee is really very problematic. Because what does it mean to say that you are loyal to someone? If I am out there as a agent for the wildcatter and I'm gobbling up leaseholds for him, and I come across a particularly valuable leasehold, and I don't take it for myself, what am I doing? What does this duty of loyalty entail? Well, a duty of loyalty entails maybe having to sacrifice your own self-interest for the interest of another. That's what a duty of loyalty comes down to. If you're loyal to somebody, loyalty means nothing when times are good. Loyalty, it's easy to be loyal to your friend, for example, let's think about this in friendship. It's easy to be loyal to your friend when they're the most popular person on the playground. Kids are cruel, aren't they? And they're fickle. And who's popular today? May not be popular tomorrow for a variety of reasons. And it can change. There was a girl in my junior high class she moved to Guthrie from out somewhere else, from out, out of town. And when I was growing up, people didn't just move to Guthrie. It was sort of a closed community. Most of us had been there all of our lives. We'd gone to school with the same people. She wasn't particularly attractive. She had a bad complexion. She was overweight. She had big, thick glasses. And people just really didn't like her very much. To show you how fickle children are, when we came back for our freshman year in high school, she'd gone and got contacts. She'd been on proactive or whatever the miracle drug <laughs> was. She had lost 30 pounds. She had shot up in height. And all of a sudden, the ugly duckling was now the swan. <laughs> and she became wildly popular in high school. She was, I think, our, uh, I think she was our football homecoming queen, as a, as a matter of fact, in my senior year. So things change. It was difficult to be friends with her when she was unpopular. But that's what true friendship is. That's what loyalty is. You're friends with them even when they're down and out, not just when they're the cool kid on the block. And what does that mean? If you're friends with somebody and they're all of a sudden lose the popularity contest, well, it can mean that you lose the popularity contest. So duties of loyalty involve this ability to sacrifice, maybe on your own behalf, for somebody else. 
Now, why would this be controversial with regard to ethics? Well, in the 1980s, companies, corporations, started looking around and noticing an interesting phenomenon. You can save money by firing old people. Why? They, they generally make more than young people starting out. They may have been with the company for a long time. They've gotten a lot of raises over the years. Maybe they've gotten promotions. And what else happens when you get older? Well, you're not as productive anymore. When you start out like you all do, when you leave here, you probably are feeling good. You're at the top of your game. You're healthy. You can work 80 hours a week and it doesn't bother you. You don't have maybe five kids at home and a spouse that's requiring your constant attention. And you can be all in. You get to be 55 and all of a sudden you got kids. You've got a spouse. You may have health issues that are costing the company money in terms of the health care costs that are going. And so a lot of companies looked around and said, wow, what we can do is if we can get rid of these old folks, we can lower our, our cost. And so companies shifted. When my grandfather died, my grandparents moved from Kentucky to Albuquerque, New Mexico because my grandfather was a scientist on something called the Manhattan Project, a little project you might have heard about in your history books. It was the project that developed the first nuclear bomb for this country. He knew Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the atomic bomb. He worked with Robert Oppenheimer on this project. My grandfather had a heart condition and he died at 38 years of age. My grandmother had a master's degree and the company that he worked for was a subsidiary on this Manhattan project called Sandia National Labs. A lot of the scientists were employed under uh, the DOD and the DOE by subs or contractors of the government. They're really kind of wholly owned subsidiaries of the government. It was called Sandia National Labs, Sandia Corporation. And when my grandfather died, the corporation hired his widow gave her a job as the classified records librarian for the company. So my grandmother's job was to go, she had a master's degree, she looked at the nuclear documents and would classify them according to a system that they had, which we might think of as being some, somewhat similar to the Dewey Decimal for top secret stuff, and then she would take it out and put it in the library, which were in, in these vaults in the Monsanto Mountains in Albuquerque. He was loyal to the company company was loyal to him. They gave the widow a job. How many companies would do that today? None. Right? Companies look at, oh my god, you're, you're a health risk, get rid of them. And so this duty of loyalty has become controversial because companies, when my grandmother retired from the company, she got a pension from that company. You went to work for a company, you worked for 20 years, you got a pension at the end. The company took care of you, you looked out for the thing of the, for the resources of the company. Companies don't do that anymore. They, they've done away with their pension plans. They've done away with lifetime employment. The average tenure of an employee now is, is something like five years or less in a corporation. Most of you will not go to work. You will be very different from me in that you will not go to work for one person and stay there and retire with that industry or that, that organization and get a pension, like I will. I, I, I love Oklahoma Teachers Retirement. I, I am out of here in 10 years, and I will get 60% at that time of an average of my high three. That's called the defined benefit plan. It's something that companies used to get, they don't anymore. And so philosophers have started saying, look, companies are not sacrificing for you. So why should you sacrifice for them? You don't owe a duty of loyalty to that company. If the company will go in and say, you're old, we're firing you, you shouldn't be loyal to them. And so this duty of loyalty 
has become somewhat problematic. How can we resolve this? Well, there has been a shift back. Balance, uh, the pendulum swings one way, and of course it will swing back. What have companies started to do? Well, they've started to say things like, well, we want to be a good place to work. We're not going to treat people like cogs in the machine. Maybe we will have a longevity, but they still don't have the benefits that they used to. You're still not getting a pension plan. You're still maybe not getting the best health care insurance. And so philosophers continue to say, we don't have a duty of loyalty. Well, what does that leave us with if we don't have this duty of loyalty? Well, I think we still have a duty of obedience. You have a duty to put in the time with your company. If they're paying you for eight hours, you have a duty to do what? You have a duty to do the work. Not sit there on your iPhone looking at uh, whatever social media app you're looking at, Facebook, uh, Ashley Madison, you know, whatever that you're doing. You have a duty to, to, to put in and, and do uh, this idea of the duty of obedience. Um, if you're a professional, you have certain, and your text talks about this, professional ethics in the gatekeeper. As an attorney, I have certain ethics that I have to follow and, and things that I should do. What does that mean with regard to my clients? Well, I do have a duty of loyalty. I can't talk about them. If you hire me as your attorney or if I'm a corporate attorney, I can't talk about the company um, you know, to its detriment. I can't release secrets of the company and things like that. So you have a professional responsibility and that's one thing that we can do in terms of uh, duty of loyalty. Um, I think you have a responsibility, and they talk about this managerial responsibility to avoid conflicts. I do think that you have a responsibility to, if you're working for a company, to not go out and harm the company, to not find out information and use that information for things like insider trading, or uh, to start your own business, take trade secrets and, and or proprietary information from the company and start your own your own business, things like that. Um, I think you have a responsibility to be honest. Not engage in lying to your employer. Don't do things like call in sick and show up. And this has happened with people they've called in sick and they're now getting fired for showing up what, oh, you know, they checked in on Facebook and somebody found out and they're you know, checking in at the baseball game and they're calling in sick, things like that. Um, finally, responsibilities to third parties, whistleblowing and insider trading and things like that. The one I want to focus on is whistleblowing because this is an important one that you have to think about. When particularly you're dealing with things like publicly traded companies and Enron, what obligation do you have to third parties such as shareholders or the public? Should you engage in whistleblowing? What's the what's problematic about whistleblowing? Does anybody want to hire you after you become a whistleblower? Yeah, you're generally not heralded through the streets on you know a sedan chair with uh, a caesarean laurel wreath around your head and everybody singing your praises when you become a whistleblower. It can, it can cost you your career. Well, federal whistleblowers are protected, but, you know, in corporations, are you protected from whistleblowing? Well, I mean, yeah, and it gets out in industries. Industries are enormously tight-knit groups of, of uh, people in many instances. And so the woman who blew the whistle, for example, at Enron, the accountant who said things are not right, guess what happened? Has she been able to get hired by any publicly traded company? Her name was, I think, Sharon Welsh. After that, I don't think so. She was, you know, it's become problematic. So Richard George has developed um, an analysis of whistleblowing, and he argues that there are three conditions, uh, George argues that there are three conditions that must be met before you uh, can engage or should engage in whistleblowing. First, there must be a real threat of serious harm that the whistleblower seeks to address, not simply a potential or a hypothetical risk of harm. Second, you should seek to prevent the harm through your immediate channels internal to the forum. 
and exhaust those internal procedures. And further, before you engage in what you're going, you should have documented evidence that would convince an impartial observer of the firm's role in causing harm. And finally, you should have a reasonable belief, a reasonable person standard that the whistleblowing will, will actually prevent the harm. So it becomes problematic. And of course, in doing this, this is a utilitarian analysis. And one of the things that you should think about in this is the greatest good for everybody. So that's also can include yourself and your family and the implications for them if you decide to engage in whistleblowing. Your text talks about insider trading. I'm not going to talk too much about insider trading because that's a legal obligation. You have a, you know, the law imposes an obligation on insider trading. You shouldn't do it. If you do it, you'll, you'll go to jail, although it's enormously hard to prove. Did Martha Stewart go to jail for insider trading? No, they couldn't prove insider trading on Martha Stewart. What could they prove? That she lied. That she lied to a federal investigator. They couldn't prove insider trading. But you, you shouldn't uh, engage in insider trading because if you do it, it's, it's a criminal act. Any question about employee responsibilities? Well, that's all I have for today. So. I passed the roll sheet, right? Yes. Okay.